Welcome to Working in Teams, Forming and Developing a Team for HIT. This is Lecture B. The objectives for forming and developing a team for HIT are to describe stages of team development, identify the needs of the team at each described stage, establish and clarify common goals and purpose for a team, identify key characteristics of effective team members, identify key factors to maintain HIT teams. In Lecture B, we will focus upon the last four objectives, which are to identify the needs of the team at each described stage, to establish and clarify common goals and purpose for a team, to identify key characteristics of effective team members, and to identify key factors to maintain HIT teams. Establishing and clarifying common goals and purpose are the necessary first steps in team formation. As discussed earlier, the project team is a working unit of individuals who share a common mission and who use a structured approach to integrate individual skills as they progress towards a common goal. Team unity is not assured by simply sharing a mission and using structured team approaches, however. In reality, many teams formed for a specific reason can fail to gel, an aspect that we will discuss later in this unit. The point is that at first formation, the mission must be very clear to the team. Trying to kick off a team effort that is unfocused and uncertain is very ill-advised. The key objectives of the mission should be a byproduct of the clarity discussions. These two aspects, clarity and objectives, are crucial to team success. Identifying the needs of the team at each described stage has been addressed by the World Health Organization, WHO, in 2007 in their report, Cancer Control, Putting Knowledge into Action. The WHO starts by presenting three major aspects of any team's work as listed on the slide. The goal, the methodology, and the resources. The premise is that in order to be able to identify the needs of the team, it is necessary to understand the aspects of the project that the team is dealing with at that moment in time. Needless to say, the needs of a team have temporal variation. What is needed at the forming or start of a team might be quite different than what is needed as a team is wrapping up and adjourning or sundowning. The first aspect that the WHO asserts is crucial to defining the needs of a team. Setting the goal is something that we have covered in prior slides. You should remember that a goal is usually derived from the team itself and is something that the team members believe in and can rally around. With that said, it is also important to consider that a team is often assembled in response to an organizational need. For example, the chief financial officer may charge a group with identifying ways to reduce expenditures, but the team then sets the specific goal and outcome measure that they are going to address, such as to reduce the length of stay by 0.5 days in surgical patients, or similar. In the case of a health IT targeted team, the executive's goal may be to reduce medication errors or to improve access to health services via telehealth for low resource people in rural communities. For the first example of medication error reduction, the team may then set a more targeted goal of to reduce the occurrence of missed doses of required medications in pre-op patients. The second aspect is the methodology or the process that is used by the team as they come to a decision, as they self-govern, and as they learn to work together. Interestingly, the WHO makes the point that technical teams struggle more with process issues than task issues which in hindsight seems to make a lot of sense. Oftentimes a team member may want to jump right in and fix something without really thinking about the big picture or the process aspects. The quick fix approach is often a technical one. The propensity to jump and go for the somewhat easier technical fix is just part of being human. The point to all of this is that a team does end up with a process or a method for doing their work and part of that process includes keeping everyone on track technical teams, at least according to the WHO, have more issues with the process piece, implying that there is constant effort required to think about the impact that the fix made has on the bigger ecosystem and the downstream effects that a quick fix may cause. As we discussed in Unit 1, health and health IT are inexorably intertwined, and the work of one team is almost never something that happens in isolation. 
A domino effect is the norm. Therefore, methodology matters. The final aspect that the WHO report addresses as they discuss the intricacies of team building is in relation to resources and determining what the team needs to remain stable and moving forward. Resources can be tangible and intangible and include things such as hardware and software, but must also include the human resource, personnel, and sufficient time allocations for the team members to have a fair chance of achieving success. This item is one worthy of additional discussion, particularly in relation to health IT. As alluded to on the last slide, the identification of resource needs and availability of those resources is a critical consideration for any team, but particularly a health IT team. There are hard decisions to be made. Health IT is an expensive venture and one that often has a very wide scope and considerable depth. Health IT is not something that just solves a single issue. A change here results in downstream effects there. There are many different dimensions to the identification of resource needs as are listed on the slide. Management requirements, planning requirements, technical requirements, design, testing, and implementation, business analysis requirements, communication requirements, leadership requirements, and customer requirements. To further detail these categories of resource needs, let's use the example of a team that has been assembled to help with the adoption and implementation of health IT across a large physician practice with numerous offices located across a geographic area. Using this example and specifically focusing on management requirements, identifying the needs to adequately manage the team is a necessary first step. Identifying the people from each office that will become member of the team and understanding their role and what they bring to the table is important and will consume resources. Recall that we also said earlier that leadership can rotate and that management of the team process may be distributed. All things must be taken into consideration as resource needs are identified. While one must continue to think about the individuals on the team, identifying the resources and needs of the team for the planning stage rises quickly as a priority. Assembling a team from a variety of locales has to be taken into consideration due to the complications of geographic distance, transportation, and time away for the job. A critical planning area for team resource needs will focus upon logistics. When will the team meet and where? Is the location for the meeting easy to get to or will transportation, with associated cost, be required? Can meetings be held via technology through a voice over the internet communication program, for example? And if so, does everyone have the ability, both technical and inexperienced, to participate fully? Identifying the business analysis requirements and the communication requirements requires deeper thought as well. If a team does not possess the expertise in business planning or financial modeling, will be the resources available to bring in an expert or a consultant? How will the cost for the team's work be managed and allocated? If the team encounters the iceberg under the surface and finds the goal that has been set will require additional resources beyond those anticipated, what is planned? Communication requirements, plans for maintaining a good line of communication, be it on the telephone or via an online meeting software or face-to-face, -face, requires dedicated resources and also requires forethought. This is particularly vital if team members are separated by distance or if cultural or language variation is expected. What end if there are two of the physician practices that are in communities where a different language is spoken or a markedly different culture impacts the practice? Communication needs to be considered not only from the technical perspective, but from the cultural and social perspective as well. What are the requirements in relation to the leadership team? As we have discussed, teams often have different leaders at different times, and some will have a formal team lead from the outset. The point is that there may be particular needs that relate to the leadership dimension. Will the team lead be required to travel to the corporate office on occasion? Will the team lead be required to visit each of the outreaches? And finally, customer requirements require planning and forethought as well. The customer can be defined widely. It could be the billing clerk in the office. It could be the patient population. It could be the other clinicians in the office. 
What will be the impact to the patients or the other office staff if the scheduling clerk as a member of the adoption and implementation team will require one day off a week for team activities for four months? Again, the point is that teams have tentacles and the impacts can be far-reaching. Therefore, it is nearly impossible for a team to form and perform without some sort of effect on the general ecosystem. It all requires good planning. We want you to think about the domino effect and prepare for the unseen aspects or complications that may arise. Identifying resource needs adequately and expecting the unexpected at the outset can save agony later in the process. The takeaway point here is that while applying the needs at these stages might seem quite straightforward, in reality a team will often encounter rough seas, hidden costs, and unplanned diversions. Health IT teams in particular are quite susceptible to the threats of the unanticipated. Why is that? Health IT has been compared to an iceberg. Oftentimes only the top of the iceberg is visible, and the majority of the bulk hides below the surface. Inexperienced teams that do not fully understand the true size and reach of most health IT projects can find themselves with only enough resources to tackle the part of the iceberg that they can see. What lurks below the surface can sink a ship or an organization. Further complicating the picture, health IT teams are often resource constrained as a balance between the costs of the system are balanced with the costs to actually make it work in practice. A fine line has to be walked to assure that the team has access to sufficient resources to accomplish the task. Even the best team cannot squeeze blood out of a turnip. Many high-performing teams who find themselves with a much larger project than was resourced for can face failure. Of course, this speaks to something that we have discussed earlier, the importance of diversity of a team. And while we don't want to return to what we have covered in prior units, it is important to say that a team member who has experience in health IT projects and or the resourcing of such efforts can be a very valuable member of the team. We will talk more about team composition later. Just remember that a diverse team with mixed skills can be a very powerful asset and may help you see the part of the iceberg that is hidden. As the resource needs and availability of those needs are being determined and finalized, other team actions remain to be addressed. Determining team composition, establishing rules of engagement, clarifying roles, responsibilities and expectations, the development of action plans, tools for measuring progress, and finally a metric for team evaluation are remaining tasks to be completed. As the team is forming, members may gather and initial action plans may be developed, but it is important to note that these first steps are not necessarily written in stone. Initial plans create a foundation on which to build a more solid plan of action. As that more solid plan of action emerges, team membership may change, meeting schedules are set, and distinct ideas about who will do what and who will lead at what time are being developed. As the plan becomes more solid and the team constitution becomes more defined, specific tools for measuring progress and evaluating performance can be decided upon. Basically, the first steps of the team are a byproduct of norming and storming, all of which contribute to team forming and subsequent steps in the process. Let's take some of those general concepts and focus them on health IT, for instance, composing teams. How are health IT teams designed? Who are the members? Why does team composition matter? Team membership in HIT is often diverse, and for good reason. One way to almost certainly ensure disaster is to create a team to plan and implement a system that does not contain representatives from the main user group or those who will be impacted the most by the new system. Having users of the system present on the team is critical. Teams can benefit from inclusion of a member with financial experience, particularly if budget projections and impact on financial dimensions are expected by implementation of a new system. 
Human factors engineers or usability experts are similarly important so that the impact of a new way of doing or a new presentation of data is understood and the unexpected consequences of system change are fully appreciated. Management presence on the team is valuable so that an understanding of the workings of the new system is fully understood. In general, team composition should not be helter-skelter. It is wise to plan carefully and thoughtfully. Should only the energetic and system-savvy people be included? Possibly not. It may be of benefit to include members of the skeptic group. A skeptic-turned-believer may be an ace in the hole to encourage adoption amongst other non-believers. Clever composition demarcates the wise leader. Developing the ground rules are also a very important piece of the puzzle. Ground rules are team-supported guidelines and statements of value that govern how members act and interact. For the ground rules to truly work, they have to be very clear, mutually agreed to, and consistently adhered to. In health IT, ground rules are not something to be tossed aside or considered as an afterthought. Why? Because in the apps of strong and consistent ground rules, normal behaviors will emerge, and while we would hope that these normal behaviors would be respectful and gracious, oftentimes they are not. Why? How are the behaviors different in health teams? Teams in healthcare are very frequently hierarchical in nature. There is a culture in healthcare hard to shake, and a failure to acknowledge this can be detrimental to any team. Can you imagine a nurse's aide on a team speaking up and telling the chief of surgery that they are incorrect or are not seeing the whole picture? If a ground rule of mutual respect, thorough listening, and constructive discussion is not clear and certain, hierarchy or norms of behavior will seep in and destroy many of the hallmarks of a high-performing team. The chief of surgery may never be questioned, and the perspectives of all members of the team may never be heard. To get a deeper understanding of how ground rules, team behaviors, and leadership traits interact, we will introduce you to Hersey's Situational Leadership Model. In this model, relationship behaviors and task behaviors are delineated and then overlaid with leadership behaviors. This will become much clearer as we move to the next slide with an illustration of these concepts. The image on the screen is a representation of Paul Hersey's situational leadership grid. While the grid looks busy, its meaning becomes quite clear with a bit of interpretation. Essentially, the type of leadership style used is based on the maturity of individual. An immature member probably needs a high degree of direction, whereas a mature team member may be better suited to delegating. The image reflects the Hersey theory of situation leadership. If an individual falls into the D1 stage of low competence but high commitment, they fit into the S1 cube on the grid, and the leadership style is highly directive. Why? Because if a member has low competence, the leader should be telling them how to do something, giving feedback, showing them how, orienting, etc. The leader needs to direct. Moving up into the S2 cell on the grid, the leadership style turns into coaching because the individual has some competence but somewhat low commitment. Therefore, the leader redirects, shares feedback, encourages, and offers praise. This cell therefore requires high directive and high supportive behaviors by the leader. The S3 cell located in the upper right of the grid is where a team member who needs high supportive behavior but less direction would be positioned. These are your highly skilled members who, for whatever reason, have variable levels of commitment to the project. The role of the leaders then shifts to one of supporting. The last cell, S4, is where the individual who has high commitment and high competence is located. At this point, the leadership style most appropriate is one of delegating. Let's try an example. As the HIT team lead, you have a young, energetic, and reasonably skilled team member who has moderate experience with CPOE systems. You are going to be out of the office for a week while some important aspects of the project are unfolding. You ask the young team member to take over and lead an aspect of the project, and then you spend two hours writing out very specific instructions of exactly how to do the work and don't understand why the team member seems dismayed. What leadership style have you adopted? Which leadership style might have been better suited for this team member? If you answered S1 to the first question and S2 to the second, you are probably right. 
If you have a team member who has experience in the domain, maybe coaching that person instead of directing would have been better. In 1948, Kenneth Benny and Paul Sheets published their theoretically based article entitled Functional Roles of Group Members, in which they presented 26 different roles that can be observed in team members. There has been much work on this model since its initial publication, but it still remains an interesting way to look at team behaviors. They posit that team roles fall within three major groups, task behaviors, relationship behaviors, and dysfunctional behaviors. Why do we provide the Benny and Sheets model to you? Because a key in forming high-performing teams is in training your eyes and ears to pick out these behaviors, facilitating and encouraging the good while detecting and mitigating the negative. While Benny and Sheets may not be the only way you can think about this, the point is the same. Being able to detect certain behaviors can help you keep your team moving forward. To begin, let's look at what is tagged within the Benny and Sheets model as the behavior role. Behavior roles are focused on tasks and include the initiator, orienter, facilitator, evaluator, analyzer, summarizer, fact seeker, and the fact giver. Many of these categories are self-explanatory and you have probably seen many of these behaviors exhibited in your own team meetings. For example, the initiator is the person who introduces new ideas and is good for stimulating discussion and facilitating alternative planned discussions. The evaluator is one who excels in reviewing and clarifying positions taken by the group. They are good at summarizing, helping the team to see forward progress, and are good at helping a team get back on track. The evaluator is just as it sounds. This is the team member who is good in evaluating suggestions and proposals, helping a team to make wise decisions. The remaining roles listed here on the slide are relatively self-explanatory. Which ones have you seen? How do you think you could use team members with these specific behavior styles at specific points during a project? Relationship behaviors, the second dimension of the Benny and Sheets model, are behaviors that focus on giving support, working at facilitating effective interactions, and providing feedback when necessary. Let's look at a few roles that are listed on screen. As in the prior slide, many of these behaviors are self-explanatory, so rather than go through all of these, let's focus on two or three of them. A harmonizer is someone who attempts to reduce tension among team members, realizing that progress depends on differences of opinion and diversity of thought, and making sure that all sides are given the opportunity to be heard. This is a very important trait, particularly in HIT teams with its inherent hierarchy and frequent interruptions. A related behavior or role is that of the gatekeeper, who makes sure that no one team member is permitted to monopolize, or on the other side is too shy to come into the discussion. Finally, the consensus tester is someone who will, from time to time, ask that very important question, how do we all feel about this situation right now? This is a way to check the pulse of the team members as they move forward and become ready for the next steps. These two overarching groups, the behavior or task roles and the relationship or supportive roles are both positive in nature. Benny and Sheets also classify a third group of team behaviors that are not positive in nature, labeled the ineffective behaviors. We will focus on them next. I think we have all seen or experienced team members that fall into the category of what Benny and Sheets call ineffective. For example, the aggressor who ridicules, questions, and attacks the status of others on the team is one particularly vexing type of behavior, as is the monopolizer. The monopolizer is someone who is verbally aggressive and is most concerned that their opinions are heard first and foremost. 
they frequently interrupt others and seem to enjoy hearing themselves talk. The avoider is someone at the opposite end of the spectrum, one who will avoid conflict at any cost and avoids voicing a contrary opinion, not realizing that healthy conflict can be rather positive for team discussions. The prankster or the clown is someone who lacks interest in the team and whose antics are distracting or sapping vital attention away from the true matter at hand. While the Benny and Sheets model is a bit long in the tooth, it still has relevancy today and is a good tool for a team leader and actually all team members to use. Recall that earlier we presented the assertion that a good leader has great personal insight. Therefore, this classification scheme may also be beneficial for you personally as you strive for personal improvement. The World Health Organization, in their document called Putting Knowledge into Action, Guide for Effective Programs, specifically addresses several strategies for assembling a team, beginning with how to select the right members for a team. They assert that, quote, having the right core team can make or break a project. Therefore, great care should be taken when selecting team members. It might be very useful to consider the following elements. Team size, overall team composition, team member selection and exclusion criteria, and member recruitment process." End quote. Therefore, we will discuss each of these elements. In discussing team size, the WHO puts forth that the recommended team size is between 3 and 12 members. However, they believe that 5 to 7 members is recommended. Teams that are too small may work quickly, but may not possess the needed diversity. Teams that are too large can be paralyzed by size. It is recommended in this article by the WHO that larger teams are sometimes needed, but it may be useful to divide larger teams into sub-teams and use expert facilitators. Oftentimes, particularly in large-scale or enterprise-wide HIT implementation projects, large teams are common. The suggestion to subdivide into smaller groups of five to seven is wise, if possible. In regards to the overall composition of teams, the WHO supports the inclusion of stakeholders who are involved in or impacted by the project. The team should include a variety of users with a wide mix of skills and expertise. Important skill dimensions to include in the team are those with strong communication skills, good people skills, meaning strong interpersonal skills, robust technical expertise, and those who possess administrative and or finance skills. Choosing team members can be both easy and hard. Politics may sometimes dictate team membership, but if possible, choosing those who are energetic, enthusiastic, open-minded, have time to devote to the work, and are viewed favorably by the eventual users of the team product can be very beneficial. Members to exclude may be those who are known disruptors and those who are suspected members of their user groups. With that said, sometimes there may be an aspect of strategy in choosing a member who is a bit suspicious of the project, or one who is a respected member of a stakeholder group that is somewhat resistant. Hopefully, the material presented to date will be of assistance as you move into the world of health IT. Work in this discipline is inherently team-based and interdisciplinary. You will need this type of knowledge. The WHO Guidelines for Team Building also presents a nice tool that provides a series of useful questions for team building. Here are a few of those questions from the report. Quote, Who are the team members, team leaders, and team liaison members? What is the reason this team exists? What is the common vision? What are the goals and targets? 
What are the norms that will guide how the team will work together? What results are expected from this team? What are the outputs expected from the team and by when? To whom should they be given? What is their agreed upon strategy? What are the steps to be followed by this team? What are the team roles and who will play them? Who is responsible for these roles? What are the norms and methodologies about decision making, problem solving process, conflict resolution, communication, cooperation and responsibility, task management, meetings and rewards? What are the resources available to support the teamwork? Who will support the team if needed? End quote. Now, whether you use these questions in their entirety or not at all, the point is that these are all important aspects that require consideration during the team building process. There may be additional questions that are dependent on the uniqueness of the project or the goal, but this set of standard questions may be helpful to you, particularly if you are tasked with pulling together a team to address an HIT challenge. This list is a quote from the WHO. Putting Knowledge into Action, Guide for Effective Programs, from page 8. The full reference can be found at the end of this presentation. The characteristics on the slide are things we have heard before. Being committed to team goals, listening with understanding, actively contributing to the team effort, recognizing and respecting other members' ideas are all hallmarks of a good team member. Of course, when these behaviors are supported within a team, the maintenance of a team becomes much easier. This requires that the ground rules or rules of engagement are established and really adhered to. A good leader leads by example with their own personal behaviors and interactions, which is fundamental, and team members must follow the lead. When all these ingredients come together, the team moves forward and the management is eased. A final point to be made in the maintenance of teams is that team membership may change over time. New members may join. Existing members may drop off. Teams do have a lifetime and constitution may change. The suggestion is that a team should not be conceived of as formed in granite. Do not be afraid to change the team membership. This concludes Lecture B of Working in Teams, Forming and Developing a Team for HIT. In summary, we have described the stages of team development. We talked about how to identify the needs of the team at each of the described stages and how to establish and clarify common goals and purpose for a team. Key characteristics of effective team members and leaders were identified, as were the characteristics of team members that should be facilitated to make the maintenance of teams easier. Finally, we made the point that teams have lifetimes and are living entities. Team composition changes, and sometimes teams finish their work and ride off into the sunset.